So, if chemicals are everywhere and the chemicals industry produces millions of unique chemical products, where should we start to better understand this landscape? Let's begin by grouping chemical products in two basic ways, by molecule type and by market dynamics. Molecules can be characterized as either organic or inorganic. Organic molecules typically contain at least one carbon-hydrogen bond. Inorganic molecules do not. The value chains for organic and inorganic materials are distinct as well. This is because the organic value chains start with carbon-containing feedstocks, like crude oil or natural gas. Like with many processes, the starting point will determine the subsequent steps. And the value chains, as we will later see in more detail, are largely determined by the feedstock they begin with. Carbon-containing raw inputs, like crude oil, are often a complex mixture of different hydrocarbon molecules. These hydrocarbons are sorted and separated during the refining processes into groups. These groups, made of a smaller number of relatively similar molecules, are called fractions. The different fractions become the feedstock for different value chains. For example, the production of nylon for fabrics starts with a specific set of fractions called the aromatics, like benzene and toluene. Naphtha is another critical fraction. Naphtha, unlike benzene, is not a specific molecule but rather a term for a range of hydrocarbon mixtures that fall within a specific composition range. The inorganic value chains work in a similar way, except that instead of oil, they start with and center around metals or salts. One of the most important of these is chlorine. In many ways, the organic and inorganic distinction is actually more important at the value chain level than at the individual product level. The production lines themselves are more distinct than what comes out of them. Organic value chains, for instance, can lead to the production of inorganic products, like ammonia and H3. The carbon-hydrogen bond, while critical at the start of the journey, doesn't necessarily make it to the destination. A second way of grouping chemical products is by their market dynamics, commodity versus specialty products. Commodity products are widely available and undifferentiated. For example, sulfuric acid, one of the most important and highly produced products. These are traded on exchanges, meaning the price is set by the market. The recipe for making these products is widely known, and many players participate. Competition is high, and profits are low. Commodity chemicals are, so to speak, a scale game. Specialty chemicals are quite different from commodities. They are more custom-made. Specific product variations are often produced exclusively for individual customers. These require specific, well-guarded recipes and production processes, aka the company's IP. Much research and effort goes into developing specialty products. Profit margins tend to be higher as well. These are much smaller markets than the commodities markets, so scale is less relevant. Often when patents expire or regulations change, products that started as specialties can become commoditized over time. This is like what happens when branded medications become generic. Many chemical companies pursue a mix of both commodities and specialties. Commodities deliver lower margins, but at high volumes. Specialties help expand into new sources of demand at higher margins.